So I want to go through a little exercise with you as we start this morning. So you might want to pair up with somebody. I encourage you to do that. If you're, well, there's three of us. Well, that's fine. Trio up. It doesn't matter to me. But just pair up with somebody uh, because I want us to do something called first word. And what I want to do is when you see the word on the screen, I want you to say the first word that comes to mind or the first thing that comes to mind. It could be a a phrase or a word or a thing, whatever. But I want you to, I want you to state to you at the same time to each other what the first thing is that comes to mind when you see each of the words on the screen. Everybody understand? Makes sense? At home, you can do this too. You can pair up with somebody at home and do this as well. All right, so the first word is bark. By the laughter, I can hear there's a lot of different answers that are being stated when it comes to bark. Uh, If you are unaware, one of uh, our financial uh, director has a dog named Bark, and so I'm sure that that came up uh, in in that particular situation. Um, So, uh, next word is connect or current. It is current, current. All right, the next word, kind. Anybody matching? Are you getting the same answers from your partner? Are you on the same, are you on the same current, if you will, the same wavelength uh, there? So you see what, I, see what I did there? Anyway, um, all right, so uh, the next one is match. How many of you said something involving fire? How many of you said something involved agreement or or somebody that matches or a couple or a person, they're a match? All right, so a lot of different answers going on out there. The next word is right. I I heard something strong over on this side. How many of you said wrong? How many of you said left? Okay. How many of you said myself with my spouse? Anybody? Okay. My counseling office shall be open this week for those of you that didn't. All right, the next word is stalk. This 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 one may fall along some generational lines. This word has changed over the years. How many of you said celery? That's the generation I assumed. How many of you, <laughs> yes, yes, sorry, yes, you. How many of you said something about uh, an evil or somebody that's stalking you? Okay, yes. See, that the word changes. It, it's become different things over the course of time. All right, the last word. How many of you said Building. How many of you said people, family, you know, church along with all these other words has different connotations, it has different meanings to different people. And I think it's important that we understand what church is, because I think a lot of our friends and our family members and maybe even somebody today has a confused idea of what church is is and largely what church is not. Today we're starting a series called Church Works and for the next several weeks we're going to be unpacking what the Bible has to say about church. What is church? What isn't church? Who leads the church? Who serves the church? How, do we, how does the church pay its bills? What are the financial things about the church? What are the structures of the church? What's the purpose of the church? And we're going to be unpacking all of these things over the next several weeks. Today, I want us to look a little bit at defining and having us understand and come to an agreement of what church is supposed to be. And so I I want us to, we'll we'll start in Matthew chapter 16 where I read earlier today. Because this is an important thing, this is uh, an important spot in the life of of our church as 
the current church is being birthed right here in this process. Because Simon Peter said, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responded in Matthew 16, 17. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overpower it or overcome it. I will build my church. Right there, we get an idea, don't we, uh, about church. One of the things that I think is strongest out of that particular passage where Jesus speaks is that it's not our church. It's, it's not your church, it's not my church, it's not our church. And let me tell you, there's some times, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not going to provide guilt or shame when we talk about, people say, well, you know, well, my church is First Baptist Crowley. We say those things and we don't mean anything by it, and I'm not suggesting that that's a wrong thing to say, but we just have to be careful that we don't start to take ownership over something that we don't own. Jesus is the head of the church. The pastor, me, may be the under-shepherd under the great shepherd, and I'm called to lead, and that's another message for another time later on in this series. But it's not, it's not our church. It's Jesus' church. We didn't die for it. Jesus died for it. And so I think that we just have to be careful that in speaking and talking about, with a healthy amount of pride and energy, and you know, this, that's my church. Why don't you come to my church with me? We just have to be careful we don't allow that to seep over into a mindset of ownership because we don't own it. Jesus owns it. But there's some other ways that church has been used, and so I just want to share with you uh, quickly a few other scriptures, and they'll be on the screen for you. Uh, if you want to flip through quickly uh, and see what I'm reading, please feel free to do that. I also have it on the screen. The first one is Acts chapter 5 and verse 11. I'll give you a second to get there because after that we're just turning pages in Acts. Acts chapter 5 and verse 11 it says, great fear came on the whole church and all who heard these things. This is the church having great fear after the Ananias and Sapphira debacle that happened. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 38, this is looking back into the Old Testament. He is the one who was in the assembly in the wilderness. So the same word that is used for church is also used for assembly. It's the same word being used by, by the author, by Luke here. The Israelites were called an assembly or called a congregation as they were being called out of Egypt. In Acts chapter 8, it says, Saul, verse 1, Saul agreed with putting him to death. That's Stephen. And on that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered through the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. And so here in verse 1, you see a localized body. In verse 3, you start to see more of a larger system called church. Why? Because we know that the they scattered everywhere at that point. And Paul, we know, was not on the road to Jerusalem. He was on the road to Damascus, yes. He was on the road to Damascus. And because of that, we begin to understand if he's ravaging the church, the church is not in one spot. The church is in several spots. And he's going around getting letters to go put people in jail because they are part of the way uh, understood by Luke as he would write, the church. Turn over to Acts chapter 9, the next chapter in verse 31. And so we see the church is growing here. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. So again, we see the church is not just something local, it is larger than that. Then finally over in Acts chapter 11, 
verse 22, and then I'll read 26 also. This is about the church in Antioch. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem, back to local. So news about another church reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. Then in verse 26, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. The kind of faith that Peter exhibited, I'm going to build my church on that kind of faith. I'm going to build my church, Jesus says. But then we see in Acts that it's not just a localized entity. Now, these are some things I'm sure many of you are already aware of, but it never hurts for us to be reminded of some of the things the Bible says about the church. It's not just a local thing. It's, it's, a, it's a becoming more global. And in, in Acts, it will reach to the global uh, aspects of what they understood as the whole world at that time. Jesus would say to be my disciples where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, to the ends of the earth. Jesus is building His church. There are localized pockets. We've, we saw a couple already, Jerusalem and Antioch. We see that it's talking about growing throughout the whole region because the church is something larger and different. Through a frail but a definite faith in Jesus Christ, He is building His church. The church was established in Jerusalem. We see that. It was established there, but then they planted other churches. They would send Barnabas over to Antioch, and they would build a church there. And then you would see it in other places. And Paul would then go around and travel and plant churches in all the cities. Many of the cities are named as letters of the New Testament. The letter to Corinth, the letter to Philippi, the letter to Colossae, the letter to Galatia, all these letters that he would write to all these churches, if you will. But The church has grown exponentially even since this first century. Let's watch this video together on the growth of the church. The five major religions in the world grew 
the gospel grew, the church grew, and you can see with all the purple that was on the screen where, where Christianity grew and it spread. I thought it was interesting with the age of discovery how Christianity seemed to spread, but nothing else spread the same way. It, it was just interesting. We have always had an evangelistic spirit about us. That's the whole point. That's our purpose, and we'll get to that in another message as well. But when we talk about the church and we see how the church has grown, we also see how we have grown. Uh, as I mentioned uh, last week, uh, this church, the church that we call First Baptist Church, was started many years ago, 1896 it started. And here we are in 2024 now. Uh, I had to make sure I get that right, we're 24. How many of you are still saying 23 and writing 23 on things? Yes, uh, some of us still are doing that. The rest of you are doing it, you just don't want to admit to it, but that's okay. So when we think about the church, when Jesus said, I'll build my church, when you see Acts talking about the church and its growth and its spread and, and all these things, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is the church? Well, first of all, the church is not a building or uh, it's, not, it's not a building at, at all. It's not a business. Now, here's the thing. We have a building, right? We have a building. And sometimes we'll call it, well, I'm going up to the church. But the church is not a building. We have a facility where we gather together as the church. The building is not the church. Now, for tax reasons, they have called us a church, and we have called ourselves a church, and the building is called a church. But it's not. The church is not a building. Even though we call it that, and even though we talk about going to the church, and we're going to, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to church. Will you come to me? Will you come with me to church? We're going to have church services at such and such. And so we use all these terms, and much like the terms we used at the beginning, they get muddy. We get confused about what it actually is. But the church is not a building. The church is not a business. Even though we have been incorporated and we are considered a nonprofit business by the state and the government, and even though we'll have budgets and we have finances and we have bills to pay and we, we bring in receipts and we give out expenses and we have uh, things to take care of and we have all the things of a business but we're not a business. We may have property and revenue and expenses and we'll have all these things, but it's not a building and it's not a business. So what is the church? It's a body. It's a body of believers. When Jesus was talking about him to build my church, while he had the infinite knowledge of God and knew what this would be, that's not his intent. The people in Jerusalem, they didn't have a building, really. They, they just gathered because they're a body of people. When we talk about what is the church, it is a body of believers. It's a body of people that are called out to a different lifestyle. We're called out to a different lifestyle who gather on a regular basis in order to make disciples. That's what the church is. It's a body of people called to be a different to have a different lifestyle, and to make disciples. If a group of people come together and are not making disciples, then that's not a church. Because the church is called to make disciples. That's the last thing Jesus said. Go and make disciples. Don't go and make a club. Don't go and make a, a commune. Don't go and, and make a celebration. Don't go, go and make disciples. Do we have community? Yes. Do we have family? Yes. Do we have fellowship? Yes. Do we have a structure? Yes. But we, the people, are the church. And we could even say we are the church at Crowley or in Crowley. But here's the thing. We're not the only ones. Now, there are some denominations that would like to say they're the only ones that are true and right and going to heaven. I'm not that arrogant. We're not, we're not the only ones. We're not, even the only, we're not even the only Baptist ones in town. There are other Baptist ones in town. So what does that mean? It means that we that call ourselves 
First Baptist Church, we're a body of believers who believe and follow Jesus Christ in order to make disciples through the missions and ministries that we, this body or congregation or assembly, do together. It doesn't mean we're the only ones in town. It doesn't mean that, that nobody else is doing it right. It just means that we call ourselves First Baptist Church and we are an assembly. We are a congregation that have gathered together and we represent Jesus Christ here. Another way to say that is that we are an assembly of citizens duly summoned. We are an assembly of citizens duly summoned. When you look at the word ecclesia in the Greek, and I don't usually throw a lot of Greek at you, but when you look at ecclesia, that's the word used for church that's a called out situation. That you have been called out of one situation and brought to a different situation in order to, to do the things you're called to do. So when I say that we are duly summoned, we are, by virtue of your faith that you placed in Jesus Christ, we assemble together as citizens of the kingdom, and we have been duly summoned to make disciples. We've also been duly summoned to assemble together. The author of Hebrews will state it this way, don't forsake, what? The assembling of yourselves together. Don't forsake that. Don't give up the assembly part of what's going on. Well, let's talk about, let's break this down into three things. I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about assembly, then I'll talk about citizens, and then I'll talk about being summoned. The idea of assembly is that we, we assemble together. We, we put times on that. At 11 o'clock, we're going to assemble together. Why do we assemble together on Sunday at 11 o'clock? For the purpose of worshiping God. Celebrating the resurrection that happened on a Sunday is why we continue to do that on Sundays. Does it make our Saturday brothers wrong for doing what they do? No. I'm not going to say that they're wrong for doing what they do. They want to hold to a Sabbath idea and hold to a Saturday service. Here's the thing. You can Sabbath any day of the week. It's about you taking that time. You know what? We live in a society in a moment, and you guys are fully aware of this. We live in a time and a place where not everybody has the luxury of being off Saturdays and Sundays. There are people out there that are serving our community and serving our area that cannot be here on a Sunday morning. It doesn't mean that, oh, well, you know, they must be lost and going to hell because they don't show up to church on Sunday. No, they could be believers in Christ, but you know what? We got bills to pay. And that causes us to have to work on different days of the week. And that's the reality in which we live. The concept is that we do, when available and when you can, we assemble together. We provide, as the body of Christ here, we provide an assembly opportunity at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. We also provide an assembly opportunity for growth and development at 9.45 on Sunday mornings. Some call it Sunday school, some call it small groups, some call it Bible study. But we gather for the purpose of education, growth, and relationship. And then we gather from around to here at 11 so that we worship God together. So we assemble. We call ourselves to assembly. There may be some moment in the future that we need to consider adding another day or time in which we call people to assembly so that we can reach more people that maybe can't do 11 o'clock on Sunday. There may be a time and a place that we have to pray about that and think through that and examine, do we need to provide other avenues so that we can reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and call them also to assemble at that time. The synagogue would assemble, but that doesn't make them a church. They were a synagogue and they were of a different faith. They were of the Judy, Judaism and they were Jewish. We as Christians gather in a place, we gather together, we assemble together, but for different purposes. They would, they would have a form of worship. We also have a form of worship. Does that make us the same? No, because we worship a risen Savior, and they do not. 
If you are not worshiping a risen Savior, Jesus Christ, you are not the kind of church Jesus said He was going to build. You may be an assembly, but it doesn't make you a church of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and He's building His church based upon His death, burial, and resurrection. And so when we assemble together, that's what we talk about. We talk about Jesus. And we don't talk about Jesus who lived, we talk about Jesus who is living. We don't talk about Jesus who was crucified, we talk about Jesus who was resurrected. Because we believe in a living God, and no other religion can claim that but Christianity. We are the only ones. And, and in that moment and in this world, that makes us elitist. And if you want to call us elitist because I believe in a risen Savior, Jesus Christ, you go right ahead. That's fine with me. I'll be elitist in that regard. But it doesn't mean we have to be condemning. Our job is not to condemn. Our job is to spread the message of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will make that determination, and the Holy Spirit handles that conviction. The Holy Spirit deals with those things, and in the end, God Himself will separate the sheep from the goats. Our job is to bring on as many sheep as we can, to change as many goats to sheep as possible. That's our job. Our job is not to hate. Our job is to love in Jesus Christ. Our job is not to condemn. Our job is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ that is life-altering, life-changing, and hope-providing. That's what our job is supposed to be. So we assemble, and we gather, and we are an assembly. We do gather, but we have distinct purposes as to why we would do that. The church is not confined to a particular place. Yes, we call ourselves First Baptist Church, but really, we are not the only ones. There are others. There, there are other churches in town. There's also other First Baptists around. Okay? We're not the only ones. And so we need to be mindful that as God drew you here and God brought you here, doesn't mean that there aren't other good places around doing the same thing that we're doing. You have to be where God has called you to be. Now, and we'll get to that duly summoned here in a second. The next word that I want to unpack for us is this idea of being citizens. Being citizens. We talk about this sometimes in the church, and we talk about being citizens of heaven, and we talk about being citizens of the kingdom, and we, we talk about in that language of it's a kingdom, and God is the king, and we have a kingdom, and we are citizens of that kingdom. We talk about how we have to live in this world, but our citizenship is really in heaven, right? We talk about those things. What does it mean to be a citizen? Well, I mean, if you want to talk about national citizenship, there are, there are protocols you have to go through. If you aren't born into it, then if you're coming into it and want to become a citizen of a nation, you have to go through different protocols and processes in order to become a citizen of that particular nation. And my friends, the same thing is true. If I want to be a citizen of heaven then there is a process that I must go through. There's a protocol that I have to go through. You cannot be born into it, but you can be reborn into it. Now, if that's not confusing enough for some of you. And a great religious leader by the name of Nick didn't understand that. So we need to understand, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to become a citizen? Well, at one, it means, one, I have to realize this that I'm currently not a citizen. You have to come to a point in your life when you realize, I'm not a citizen of heaven, and the reason why I'm not a citizen of heaven is because I have done sinful, wrong things in my life. Anywhere from stealing a paperclip to being an axe murderer, it doesn't matter. All of it's the same. You have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and there is absolutely nothing that uh, any of us could have done to overcome the sin guilt that was placed on us because of our own sin. The guilt that we have is we cannot get rid of it. We cannot pay it off. We can't pay it back. It, it is something that will forever and ever be on our lives unless you accept 
that Jesus paid it off for you when you couldn't pay it. Now, for some of us, that's really tough. That's really hard because we're prideful people. And we want to we want to pay off our own debts. I don't want anybody helping me. I don't want anybody paying off my debts. I don't even want anybody knowing what my debts are. Let me tell you, we just bought a house, and everything about our entire life has now been known by three or four or five people. Because, man, they want to know everything about your life, specifically financially. Man, they want to know it all. There's stuff they drug up I wasn't aware of. There's stuff we drug, that they drug up don't see that we didn't know about. What is this? See, we have debt before God that we can't pay. We can't pay it off, and it's going to stare you right in the face, and it's going to inhibit you until we come to the point where we say, you know what, I can't pay this off, but I've been told that a man named Jesus who lived a perfect life and he died a cruel death just to pay off the debt that I have, and when he rose from the dead, he sealed it off, and it says, paid in full. But here's the kicker. It could be completely paid in full by what Jesus did. But if you never accept it, it's the Christmas gift left under the tree unwrapped. If you never open it, then you don't receive it. The giver knows what's in the box. The giver knows what's there. The giver is excited for you to have whatever is in that box. But if you say, I don't want that box. I don't need that box. I've got all the boxes I need. I don't need that box. I don't need what's in that box. The giver is saddened because they know what life-changing thing could be in that box. And they're sending people to you to say, why don't you open the box? I opened a box, and it was great. She opened a box, and it was great. Why don't you open the box? Well, I don't need that box. I'm scared of what's in that box. I don't know what's in that box. I don't want to open something that I'm not fully aware of. Here's the thing. The giver has already told you what's in the box. It is the most impressive, life-altering thing you could ever have. It is new life. It is, if you will, it is that receipt that says, your debts have all been paid, and you have a big stamp on it that says, paid off. And you, when you open that box, you say, God, I believe, I wasn't there, but I believe Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose from the dead, all because of your great love you've demonstrated through that. God, I, I confess to you that I have sinned and cannot pay that back, but I trust that what Jesus did is sufficient, so God, forgive me and lead my life from this point forward. When you do that, you have unwrapped it, you have opened it, and you have received the gift. That is forgiveness. The gift that is then eternal life. Then you have become a citizen of heaven. And in that you have become a part of the church. The big C church. You become a part of the church. Because you 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 have become a citizen of the church. We read through Scripture and we see some of the early actions of Peter and the apostles in Acts. And we see that it was very important and Jesus honored it as well. We see that it's very important that when you make a decision to turn from going this way to turn and going this way, that's the big word repent. I have been walking this way which is away from God. I've been going in this direction doing my own thing, my own way, my own time frame and I have stopped and I have said, you know what? That leads to destruction, that leads to death, but this leads to life. And so I'm going I'm to turn, I'm going to repent of what I've been doing, and I'm going to turn and walk this way. I'm going to walk toward God, with God, for God, and I'm going to drag as many people with me as I can and have them open their own boxes. And in doing that, you have become a citizen. A part of that repent, when you read what Peter did, is you, they made a turn, and as they made a turn, they wanted a public demonstration of what that turn is. And not only was it a statement of faith, but it was an action. It was a physical action of baptism. And as you were baptized, it was that public proclamation. Our church's uh, understanding, we do two different things. One we did today. We, we take the Lord's Supper. We commemorate what Jesus did. That's one thing we call an ordinance. We do that. Another thing is baptism. A baptism that states, according to Scripture, when you make your decision of faith in Christ... 
you follow that with a public profession of baptism. And in that baptism, the baptism doesn't save you, y'all. The baptism is a part of your new life, not the sealing of your salvation. Your faith is enough. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism simply starts you on your journey that you publicly professed by doing that and being a part of that. And we, we're, we're going to have one. We'll share that in a few minutes, but we've got one scheduled. It's coming up. And praise the Lord, we get to witness another public proclamation of somebody taking the steps of faith with Christ. We had 11 of them last year. We're praying for 12 this year. To see lives changed and transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. A part of being a, a part of this church, the little C church, the big C church is salvation. The little C church, we want to see baptism and a public proclamation of that so that you ha have shared that and become a part of who we are as a local church. So, we assemble together, we are citizens together, and we also are summoned together. We're gathered right now for worship and prayer and instruction. This is what we do on Sunday mornings. We have a time of fellowship and prayer and ministry times also on Wednesday nights. And so we, we provide these, and we, we, we call, I call it duly summoned. Why? Because we've been called out. But anything you want to do in life and you try to do it all by yourself, you're going to struggle. Anything you want to do, you're going to struggle. Uh, an example, if one of you wants to be on a diet and the other one of you doesn't want to be on a diet, you will struggle. If one of you wants to make better choices but the other one doesn't want to make better choices, you're going to struggle. Why? Because it takes coming together and supporting and encouraging and helping one another. This is why the prophet would say a cord of three strands can't be broken because you weave together and you are exponentially stronger by doing it together. My friends, we don't gather for our clicky groups on Sunday morning. We gather together to support the whole body here in this moment to support one another to walk and follow Jesus Christ better in the coming week than the past week. We don't come together just to see our friends, although that's an important product of what we get to do because we make new friends. But we have been summoned by the Holy Spirit of God that we would gather together on a routine, regular basis so that we can worship God, strengthen one another, encourage one another so that we can go from this place and scatter with the gospel in hand and in mind and in word. This is what we're called to do. We're called. We are summoned. And I feel sorry for those who claim Christianity and say, I have no desire to ever go to the church. I don't think those two things can go together. There's a problem. There's a struggle somewhere in that process. So, my friends, what are we to do? Well, there's three questions that I want to share with you. There's three questions I want to share with you. First, are you a citizen? Are you a citizen? Have you come to that point in your life where you have made that decision of faith in Jesus Christ? Are you a citizen of heaven? Because if you haven't done that, that's your primary concern this morning, is to make that decision in Christ. Have you become a citizen? Are you sure that you have? If you haven't, why, why not now? Why not do it today? At least start that conversation with one of us. Do you feel the summoning of the Holy Spirit? You say, well, I'm here. Excellent. Do you, do you feel the summoning of the Holy Spirit? When I was growing up, I felt the summoning of my mother, which was right and good in her parental duty. But my friends, there comes a point where you have to make that decision by the summoning of the Holy Spirit to gather together. Because if, you, if you're summoned by mom, then you may be confused that you also got saved by mom. And that cannot happen. So you have to come to the point, well, I, I don't ever feel summoned. It's just what I do. Now listen to me. I think habits are great, and good habits are great, and, you, and I think... Gathering together should become a habit in your life, in your routine. But if it's just another thing you do, then you've summoned yourself. But have you been summoned by the Spirit? 
These are deep questions that you have to consider in your life. Are you being summoned? Are you being led by the Spirit of God? And finally, the third question is this. Will you commit to this assembly? Will you commit to this assembly? Will you commit to worship attendance on a regular basis? Will you commit, if you've been coming, if you haven't been coming to worship regularly, will you commit to that? If you've been coming regularly, will you commit to uh, the next phase and to growth and, and, and education and being a part of a small group? We have those at 945. There may be others that are going to be born and birthed in the next months or year that will provide different opportunities. Right now, we have them at 945. Will you commit? That's your next step. Sometimes people, well, what's my next step? If you aren't a Christian, your next step is to put your faith in Christ. If you are a Christian, your next step is to commit to assembling together for worship. Your next step is to move into growth and become a part of a small group and be to grow and to develop and be a part of that. An offshoot next step is also look for a way to serve. Look for places and to serve, whether it's the community or in, in, in this gathering, but for us to serve together. These are the questions. Only you have your answers. I hope that in the moments ahead as we pray and then we will sing together, that you will consider deeply, am I a citizen? Am I being summoned? And am I committing to this assembly? Let's pray together.